I'm Laura Chapman uh, from Kylie Thompson Caisley and I'm here with my colleague Scott Worthy. We've been getting a lot of questions from employers who are understandably quite anxious about um, the future of their businesses and they want to understand what options they have if they end up in a situation where they have to cut costs because of a reduction in their business. We're obviously in unprecedented and uncertain territory. We're hoping that any downturn will be temporary. On the other, we don't know what that means, and some economists are predicting effects lasting many months, if not years, and obviously that's going to affect employers in different ways. The good news is that there are lots of options. Um, We will release another podcast soon speaking about some of the innovative solutions uh, that we've been seeing um, in both in the past and in recent times. First, though, we're going to tackle some of the more tricky legal questions um, that we are being asked by employers. So, Scott, first question. If it becomes necessary to terminate employees' employment, could there be some sort of force majeure situation? Well, the first thing to understand about force majeure is that it's a contractual concept. Either your contract has one or it doesn't. And it's more common in commercial contracts, which sometimes sometimes contain clauses that allow for termination of a contract without any liability or may otherwise excuse a party from performing its obligations in certain circumstances. Some of these circumstances might be acts of God, such as natural disasters, and could include acts of terrorism or war, or other causes beyond the control of the parties. But the contract will have to say when force majeure applies and what the consequences will be. And it's pretty unusual to see these types of clauses in employment agreements, although they might well be in agreements with independent contractors. Where there is a clause, the party wanting to use the clause to get out of the agreement needs to show that the COVID-19 outbreak falls within the scope of what was contemplated when the parties agreed that clause. And the key considerations will be, does the force majeure clause expressly say that a pandemic or a contagious contagious disease would constitute a force majeure event? Or has the coronavirus outbreak resulted in events mentioned in the clause? For example, a particular project project is stopped or an event can't now happen because of the virus. Where a clause contains general language like anything beyond control of the party terminates the contract or a contract doesn't have a definition of what force majeure means or maybe pandemic isn't listed amongst the definition in the force majeure clause, then it will be unclear whether that clause applies. When that happens, the specific facts of each contract, the effects of the coronavirus on the contract, and the likely intentions of the parties in entering into the clause would need to be assessed. Given the fact-specific nature of that analysis, any reliance on these type of clauses could well end up in a dispute. So if it's not a force majeure or we're thinking about other options, another, another curly question that's coming up is, you know, are these contracts frustrated? Um, so is it possible that employment contracts or, or other, um, other self-employed contractor contracts can become frustrated? Um, yeah, Laura, doc- frustration is a curly concept. The doctrine of frustration usually arises where, through no fault of their own, an event makes performance by one or more parties impossible or radically different from what the parties originally intended. In an employment situation, the most obvious example of this is where the employee dies. Where a contract is frustrated, it just ends without any further contractual liability on any of the parties. This area of law is largely untested in New Zealand in the employment context. Again, the analysis of whether a contract is frustrated will depend on the terms of the contract, the background to why the parties agreed the contract in the first place, and what the parties thought about how the contract would be performed in the future if things changed. As a result, even the courts say the application of frustration to real-life examples is really difficult. Applied to the employment context, we think it might be hard to show an employment agreement is frustrated by the coronavirus pandemic. And there are several key reasons for this, but I just want to mention two of them. Firstly, there is already a way to end most employment agreements where there is a reduction of business or a business closure. Most employment agreements will contain some sort of reference to redundancy, and therefore the court may think that the parties have already covered off what happens 
when unexpected events like a pandemic cause a business slowdown. So there's no need for frustration. Secondly, if a business is still operating, but with reduced demand and reduced workforce, the court is unlikely to say a contract has been frustrated. That's because absence of a full or indefinite closure of business, for example, a cafe that has to close indefinitely uh, because the government says cafes have to close, in the absence of that, it's unlikely that a court would rule that some contracts have, for some employees have been frustrated, but others for other employees have not, when at least part of the business is still going. As with force majeure, a lot will depend on the individual context of each employment agreement. Scott, speaking of um, employment agreements, m- more recently, and particularly since the, the devastating Christchurch earthquake, we've seen employers put clauses into employment agreements that give them certain rights where their businesses have been disrupted due to external events. Uh, are the business disruption clauses helpful in these circumstances? Well, again, there isn't a lot of case law about these sorts of clauses. But having said that, these clauses do often talk about the rights of companies to suspend employees for certain periods of time and or take other measures to reduce their costs. Even with such clauses, an employer will still have a duty of good faith towards its employees and an employer will still need to clearly be able to justify its actions and follow a fair process if it does try to implement any measures uh, under a business disruption clause. Having said all of that, a contractual right is at least a good starting point to have those sorts of discussions with employees. If employers don't have such a clause in their employment agreements at the moment, it might be a good idea for any future agreements. I think before we lose our audience completely, um, there's certainly enough for them to be thinking about at the moment, and we hope that that's helped employers thinking. But Scott, any final thoughts? Uh, We've talked about a number of tricky legal concepts in this podcast, but employment law is more often than not about what's doing doing what's fair in in the circumstances, and that involves balancing the rights and obligations of an employer against those of employees. And we may need, employers and employers may need to come up with some innovative ways to deal with this crisis. But the overriding obligation is that employers should act in good faith and whenever they can in consultation with employees.